Welcome to podcast number 12 of the Divine Warrior Nijutsu Podcast for September 2018. This is Shihan Jason Steves, and we have some other guests with us today as well. So let's not wait any longer. Let's get started right away. Here we go. I thought I'd start with a little something that I've been using lately to meditate, and I thought I would share it with you, so enjoy this.
And now for something a little more serious. This is not Karachi, it's London. Britain's policy of mass immigration has brought what one expert is calling demographic upheaval to the United Kingdom. It's now a demographic certainty. Someday the white native English will be a minority in their own country. It's just a matter of when. Also the native Welsh and the Scots. David Coleman is supernumerary fellow in human sciences and university professor in demography at Oxford. He's written that uncontrolled immigration could lead to a finis Britanniae. Which simply means uh, the end of Britain. And by that I mean the end of Britain as we know it. The, uh, the change in the number of people um, and particularly the change in, in the origins of the people, in, in their religion, in their uh, cultural background and everything would, would, make, uh, would make Britain um, um, unrecognizable compared with the present time. Immigration can strengthen a nation, but several Western nations, including the U.S., are debating the wisdom of large-scale immigration from the Islamic world. And experts are asking what will happen as Muslim numbers continue to grow in officially Christian Britain. In the dystopian masterpiece Children of Men, Britain in 2027 is racked by ethnic division and civil war. Muslim armed gangs fight a government that is hunting down and deporting immigrants and trying to maintain order. Britain's future is not likely to be this violent, but it may not be peaceful either. When the Christian activist group Britain First took large crosses through the English town of Luton last year, angry Muslims confronted them. It's your country, is it? Yeah. It's a Christian country. It's a Christian country. Yes, it is. This is a Christian country. You're jealous. You're jealous that we're taking over. You're Muslims will take over. What? Urban areas are becoming increasingly Islamic, while rural areas are becoming increasingly English. And there's a retreat away from these these two populations from each other. That's 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 the future that is that is already happening that the media isn't interested in. Policy analyst George Igler says he does not believe it will take 40 or 50 years before the native British are a minority. This is a nonsense. It's going it's going to be much sooner. And more importantly, when you look at places like Luton, we already have an understanding. We already have a window into what this future will be like. It's going to be violence and sexual violence against non-Muslims. It's going to be Sharia law. Muslims are still said to be only 5% of the population, and some experts insist they will never be the majority in Britain. Immigration also includes Christians from Africa. Professor Coleman, who stressed he is not anti-Muslim, but is simply looking at statistics, nevertheless said the changes could be drastic. Uh, this is already manifest because there are there are strong um, currents in in Muslim society which, which wish to wish to see um, Muslim uh, approaches to diet uh, to marriage uh, and would like to see Sharia law incorporated formally um, in, in, into British law or, or um, in, in in respect of some extremist groups would like to see a Sharia law replace uh, British law. More than half a million non-British citizens immigrated to the United Kingdom in 2016. Open borders was a big reason the British voted for Brexit, to leave the European Union. But Coleman says Brexit will not stop immigration from non-European nations. Jihad is on its way! Jihad is on its way! Great Britain was already a factory for terrorists before last week's attack on Westminster Bridge by a British-born Muslim. At least 850 British citizens have left the UK to join ISIS. We have around 100 Sharia courts in this country. We're the only Western country with a functioning Sharia uh, network of Sharia tribunals and councils. They're dealing with marriages, with divorce, even with criminal matters. 
they're marrying, as I said, they're marrying children. If current trends continue, British schools will change when most of the pupils are from non-British backgrounds, as will British foreign policy and military alliances. England is not going to be England anymore. We want our country back. We want our country back. The English Defence League, in its street protest against the Islamization of Britain, used to sing "We want our country back." If current demographic trends continue. It may be too late for that. Dale Hurd, CBN News, London. Authorities in the UK are continuing their investigation into the Manchester bombing, arresting two more men. Eight people are now in custody and a clearer picture of the suspect, Salman Abidi, is emerging. He was a 22-year-old British-born citizen. He'd returned from Libya in the days before the attack and the sophistication of his bomb makes authorities fear he wasn't acting alone. That means the prospect of a terror network is in play and it's prompting some members of the local Muslim community to claim authorities missed warning signs. One of them is Mohammed Shafiq. He joins me from downtown Manchester now. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Good evening. What do you know about this terrorist? Well, we know about two years ago, a community activist here in Manchester uh, understood that uh, Salman Abidi was expressing viewpoints which were extremist, and he was uh, glorifying suicide bombing and supporting uh, Islamic State. And he reported that to the counter-terrorism unit uh, through the hotline uh, on two separate occasions. And as well as that, a number of family members were also reporting uh, the, the radicalization and the extremism that uh, Salman possessed and reported that to the authorities. So uh, he was on the radar of intelligence agencies and there are serious questions uh, for our intelligence agencies and police in this country to answer about what they knew, what they did with that information and whether they followed it through. What do you think of the possibility that there's a like-minded uh, network of people in Manchester? Sorry, say that again? What do you think of the possibility that there's a network of like-minded people in Manchester or elsewhere in London? Well, we know that, uh, you know, he's not a lone wolf. There's a cell of terrorists who have supported him, who financed him, who helped build the bomb. And that's why the police are working extensively hard here in Manchester to make sure that we can capture the people behind this and make our city safe. Uh, we face a huge threat from terrorism in this country and around the world. We've got to be unified, and you saw that here in Manchester this week, uh, this week in the last few days, of Manchester people, people of faith, people of no faith, all coming together in unity uh, against terrorism and against extremism. Given that, you know, Manchester is a great community, why do you think that this message of death and destruction appeals to some young Muslim men? There is um, a reality about uh, extremist narrative around foreign policy and around military adventures around the world that, that people are brainwashed, they use an ideology of violence that, to distort our Islamic teachings and that is something uh, which we've got to confront as a community and we have been doing for a number of years. Take on the ideology, expose their finance sources, expose them people and, and make sure that no, no other person can be killed in the, in the line of terrorism. You mentioned that some of the uh, people in the local community were aware that he had expressed some um, extremist points of view and had even alerted counter-terrorism authorities to that. Did anyone, do you know, in the community take him aside and say, listen, what's, what's going on here? Where, where, where's this going? Um, I do know there are a number of people who did have conversations with him over the years. Um, some of them then reported that to the counter-terrorism police uh, hotline. Uh, others didn't approach him. Um, you know, we know that he was known to intelligence agencies. We know that uh, people were aware of his actions, his viewpoints. Um, the mosque, for example, that he used to go to prayer Friday prayers, the imam there was speaking out against ISIS um, and uh, the barbaric nature of their crimes. And so people were aware that um, he was expressing uh, very controversial viewpoints which was endorsing violence and barbaric crimes. Uh, and I think we, we need to really hear what the intelligence agencies have to say about what they did with that information when they received it. We've heard a lot about how the broader community in Manchester is pulling together. Is there any blowback at all against the local Muslim community? Honestly, since Monday night, no, there hasn't been. 
Monday night, just after the explosion, taxi drivers, predominantly Muslim taxi drivers, were picking up people, dropping them off to make sure they got home safely. One taxi driver dropped somebody off 60 kilometers away. Uh, the people open their doors, people open their hearts. And here in, in, you know, in, in downtown Manchester, uh, people are not allowing people to divide us. And we're going to stand absolutely resolutely determined, united against terrorism with one voice as one city. And we're very proud of the fact we've shown the world uh, how you react to a terrorist atrocity. Mohamed Shafiq, thank you very much for your time this evening. Uh, let me turn to somebody who uh, has uh, lived and breathed this for, for many, many years. Our next guest, uh, his name is Brother Rashid, uh, and he knows the Muslim faith intimately. Uh, he is originally from Morocco. Uh, he was a devout Muslim. Uh, but today he runs a very, very popular show. He is an author, writer, and as, as I mentioned, a host of a popular show called Daring Questions. And this program, by the way, is seen across the Middle East and Europe. Uh, he is originally from Morocco, once a devout Muslim, until, here's the good story, here's the good part, until he met Jesus Christ and became a Christian. Brother Rashid, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, ISIS says killing people especially during Ramadan, is honored, is honored in the eyes of Allah. In fact, those who commit it during Ramadan get an extra reward. What's going on here? Well, thank you so much for having me first. And uh, uh, our prayers goes, um, go to the family of the victims in, in England and everywhere in the world. Um, yes, Ramadan is a month of jihad. Ramadan is... Uh, is not sacred in the way um, Westerners will understand sacred. Sacred because um, it's for Allah and for the cause of Allah. So everything that's um, happening in Ramadan, it's for the sake of Allah. Jihad uh, started even in the early Muslim history, it started in Ramadan. There is one um, huge battle that changed the history of Islam called the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr was, um, happened in the 17th of Ramadan. And that battle was actually a raid um, on a caravan for the tribe of Muhammad. Muhammad raided his own tribe, his, the caravan of his own tribe, to steal their goods and to sell the prisoners. Um, he didn't succeed to do that, but the, a fight started between his tribe and his men. And he, um, it ended by him winning um, that battle. Every Ramadan, Muslims celebrate that battle um, every 17th of Ramadan. There is another battle. It's called the uh, Al-Fatih, the opening, when they opened Mecca. Muhammad went to Medina, and on, on the eighth year of Hijra, immigration to Medina, he came back to his own tribe. Uh, he, he raided his own tribe with 10,000 men. That was on the 20th or the 21st of Ramadan. It depends on which story you will take, but it happened in Ramadan. So um, all these things happen in Ramadan. Even even the victory in um, in, in uh, Iberia in what's called Spain today, it happened during Ramadan. So he invaded um, Spain and they um, uh, they had a huge victory there um, uh, in a battle called Guadalupe. And, and, and they won, and it was during Ramadan. So Ramadan is a month of jihad. Uh, if you are joining us on Facebook, you are listening to Brother Rashid, a former Muslim who was uh, very, very devout, uh, read the Quran from back to front and understands the, understand, understands the faith and the roots of the faith. Uh, you have taken to Twitter, Brother Rashid, uh, since uh, the attack last night. And in fact, you have been tweeting uh, on all these various attacks uh, carried out by Islamic terrorists around the world. You say that Muhammad made a deal with his followers that if they kill, they will get paradise. Can you quickly tell us more about that? Well, that's actually a verse in the Quran. It's in chapter 9, um, verse um, 111. It says the following. I'm reading from an English translation. Indeed, Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and their properties. In exchange for that, they will have paradise. And they fight in the cause of Allah, so they kill and are killed. 
Um, so if you die as a martyr in Islam, you are dying for the cause of Allah, and God uh, and Allah will give you paradise um, in the afterlife. Uh, I, let me just stay with you for a second, Brother Rashid. You said to me the other day that uh, uh, Islam was born deformed, and uh, those yeah. who try to uh, call for a reformation, like a reformation that took place in Christianity, is yeah. is dreaming that a reformation in Islam can never take place. You you agree with that, right? Yes, I agree, hundred um, uh, percent. Reformation was. When, when Martin Luther said sola scriptura is going back to the scripture, going back to the roots. If you take Islam to the roots, to the life of Muhammad and to the scriptures, to the Quran, then we are in big trouble. Because the life of Muhammad, he did 83 raids in almost eight years. And he did so many battles. He was not a peaceful man. And the first Muslim community they lived out of those rates. So if we go back to the roots, we are in big trouble. Uh, Brother Rashid, hold on for a second. Let me go to Simon Barrett uh, of Revelation TV. Um, Simon, uh, how do we defeat uh, the scourge of radical Islam? I know you have a broadcast on Revelation TV covering the Middle East. Uh, what do you tell your viewers? Uh, what I tell our viewers is that uh, we need to pray. I mean, this is ultimately a spiritual battle. We're dealing against principalities and the powers of darkness. We win this in the spiritual realm. But also, if we take history, for example, uh, one of uh, Britain's greatest kings was King Alfred the Great, who actually was a, a born-again Christian who actually defeated the Vikings. Uh, with God's strength, he defeated those Vikings, and it was in that defeat that the Viking chiefs thought that they were going to be slaughtered and murdered. He showed them mercy, and through him showing them mercy and love, they actually repented and converted to Christianity. So we need a bold, radical form of Christianity where we're not afraid that when we're fearless and when we put God first rather than man first, and, we'll, and as believers, we start praying and interceding for our governments, we start interceding for our nations, then I think we can see that we'll make a difference. But we also got to recognize that we have to address the Jew hatred that it is in so much Islamic theology to understand that we need to align our nations with God's nation, which is Israel, and align our nations with God's foreign policy, and that's defending Israel and the Jewish people. And if we do that, then I think we stand a very good chance of confronting and defeating uh, radical Islam. Okay, terrific. Uh, at, uh, on, that, uh, on that note, Simon Barrett, thank you so much for joining us on this special broadcast covering the terror attacks in London. Thank you so much. Uh, let me go to Dale for your last word, Dale, you have uh, uh, done incredible stories of how Muslims from Afghanistan, Iran, other countries who converted to, from Islam to Christianity and then are finding refuge uh, in Europe. And in fact, they are turning around and going into their neighborhoods that were once thriving Christian communities and now are dying. These Muslim converts to Christianity are going out into these neighborhoods and saying, hey, guys, come to church. In fact, you did a story about a church that was dying uh, in one European country. And these Muslim converts to Christianity went out to the neighborhood and invited them to, to church. Is that the answer? And by the way, Simon Barrett for prime minister, he's got my vote. Uh, <laughs> the, the election is next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The way you described it, the West and Christianity is a hollowed out tree and Islam is a vine growing around it. And we've and prayer, prayer for our leaders, speaking boldly, not being afraid of the racist label because we we say it in love. But we say the truth in love about what the problem really is. And we pray for leaders that will do that, too. OK, terrific. Dale, as always, sir, thank you so much for joining us on the special broadcast. Let me get one last word from our senior international correspondent, Gary Lane, who has traversed the far corners of this uh, of this globe, uh, telling uh, incredible stories of persecution uh, around the world. Uh, you have met face to face with many of these Muslim converts who have had encounters with Jesus Christ. Many of them have come to faith uh, through dreams and visions. And that is the hopeful aspect of this broadcast as we leave folks here, as we wrap up. That is the hope that, that Jesus is appearing to thousands of Muslims around the world. You know, many people have asked me, they said, why is all of this happening right now? And I think God is doing something here. I'm not saying he's responsible sure. for this terrorism, but he's going to do something good out of this, believe me. And the Muslims know that, those who have, uh, former Muslims who have come, come to Christ, 
Two things here, George. One thing, we've heard about Ramadan and how these happen in Ramadan. Keep in mind, uh, ISIS is under intense pressure right now in Syria, in Iraq. Many of them have fled. They're coming back home. OK, and that's why we're seeing some of this right now. ISIS is kicking back. Uh, in addition to that, we've told you about Dabak and how ISIS wants the world's armies to come against them in Dabak, Syria, because they believe that will usher in the Mahdi, who is the Islamic savior, who will bring Islam to the world. So keep those things in mind. But also keep in mind, and I hear this from former Muslims I've met uh, all around the world, they know that God is in control. And in the end, we win. Mm. Uh, Brother Rashid, to you, a final word from you. Uh, you have a, uh, a weekly broadcast called Daring Questions, where you, as a former Muslim, uh, confront uh, th those in the Muslim world about their faith. Uh, you are sharing this message on your show. How do you encourage uh, Muslims to stop um, acts of violence? What do you say to them? How do you tell them to turn their lives around? Well, I say um, to my Muslim brothers and sisters everywhere that I love you and uh, we are and we were uh, victims of this ideology of Islam and we need to get out of it because it's, uh, it's destroying us and destroying others as well. It's, it's hurting everybody. So we have to think about it. Um, violence is coming from the text. It's not something that just happened today. It was through the 1400 years of our history, Islamic history. Um, look at the, the, the life of Muhammad, look at the life of his followers, his companions. All of them, they participated in violence. It's a holy violence. And that's why we need to reject it. We need to come and embrace peace and love for everybody. And I invite them as well to look at um, Jesus' life because um, uh, it changed me. It can change many Muslims around the world. People are equal. Ideologies, values are not equal. Religions are not equal. And what I told you before, the cultural relativists, people who believe that all cultures are equal, are the, 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 the proof of the biggest disease Europe faced in the last decades. Cultural relativists who say, and Islamic culture is the same as Christianity. Allow them and don't demand from them to integrate and to assimilate. This is the worst thing that has happened to us. Many Dutch find his views not just repellent, but dangerous. So will Gert Wilders take power on March 15th? Probably not, as the mainstream parties will do their best to block him. But there's no doubting this man is changing what was once the most liberal country in Europe into something quite different. It's quite striking that uh, even though there's a lot of attention for uh, Islamic radicalism worldwide, there's actually very little known uh, about the degree to which uh, fundamentalist religious beliefs and uh, hostility towards outgroups uh, are spread among uh, Muslim immigrants in Western Europe. So we know a lot about religious fundamentalism in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, but we know very little about the extent to which there is also a support base for fundamentalist ideas and radical views among Muslims living in Western Europe. Um, and what we found is uh, that there is a, quite a strong uh, degree of support for uh, fundamentalist beliefs among uh, Muslims in Western Europe. It varies a bit uh, across countries, but on average we're talking about uh, about 40 to 45 percent of the Muslim population in Western Europe who have a fundamentalist view uh, on their religion. Fundamentalism means the idea that there is only one interpretation of the Holy Scripture, that every believer must stick to, these, uh, to, to this one interpretation. Why do you specifically train? And then why should everyone train? I physically train for personal self-defense, and I think everybody should so they can protect themselves and the ones that they love. In today's society, you never know what's going to happen at any given time. You hear the school shootings and everything all the time. People should be ready for stuff like that instead of running away. Why do you train martial arts? Simple. <laughs> Just to make myself eat better than yesterday.
Because I was getting answer. stagnant at home. That's a good I'd answer. Work, come home, go back to work. Why do you think anybody should train? Well, fitness and safety. Yeah. Better to know what you're doing than not. Yeah. So, it's very much the same principle as why everybody should know how to use a firearm. Better to know and not need it than need it and not know it. Yes, that applies for a few things. <laughs> do you want to give your name? James. Uh, to answer the question as to why do I train, well, uh, first and foremost is uh, physical fitness and getting better balance, uh, flexibility, learning how to protect myself in, in situations. Uh, the non-combat aspects of this martial art are actually more interesting to me because uh, it's not just how do I fight, but also how do I live, how do I survive. As for why somebody else should train, uh, there are way too many reasons. <laughs> this, this particular art combines eight different martial arts, but on top of that, we also study other martial arts to learn what they, how they will likely attack and how to defend against them. We also study various other things to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, what's one example I could use? Tracking. So I can go out in the woods and from what I've learned at the school I can uh, track either an animal if I'm lost and need to find food or let's say somebody broke into my house. I can follow their footprints. I can track them down, find the person who broke in. Uh, lock picking. If you forget your key in your house, you know how to pick a lock in your house. You don't need to break a window anymore. <laughs> sure. Uh, there are, or the same actually applies to vehicles. How many times have you locked the uh, key in your vehicle? Now you'll know how to get in without breaking anything. Um... Escape tactics. If you are kidnapped, how do you get out of your bonds? How do you get out of the vehicle that you're being captured in? Anti-terrorism. Uh, if you're on a plane that has been boarded with terrorists and they try to take over, you learn how to defend against that. But we also teach survival. We teach... Uh, so, uh, in essence, dodgeball, although not specifically dodgeball, but how to dodge objects being thrown at you. Uh, we learn how to uh, fight in water, which no other martial art does. So, if you're swimming and you get attacked, well, you know how to... you're in a familiar situation. You know how to deal with it. I guess... I mean, there's a very, very long list of reasons why anybody should train. And for me to try to cover it, I mean, I'm assuming what you would be interested in. It, basically, I think everybody should train because this martial art has, correct me if I'm wrong, but what was it, two or three thousand non-combat? Oh, course. that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, eight martial arts combined, plus two or three... Nine, technical. Sorry, yeah, nine <laughs> martial arts combined, plus thousands of non-combat uh, arts to learn. Everything from flower arranging, uh, to weapon making, to uh, castle construction. There's something here for everybody. Bottom line. Yep. Absolutely. And, uh, if you want to say your name. Lurch. Okay, there you bet. Or Jason Fisher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to keep my family safe and learn survival skills. Why should anybody train? To keep their families safe and learn survival skills. <laughs> Fair enough. Would you like to say your name? Robert. 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 Why 
Do you practice martial arts, or in particular, ninjutsu? Well, especially in particular for ninjutsu, I practice it because it not only pertains to actual hand-to-hand -hand combat or any fighting scenario, but also because it pertains to survival, which I'm very interested in. I consider myself an outdoors person, so I, I'm very much interested in learning how to survive in any type of situation, not just when it comes to fighting somebody but also because of the fact that I just enjoy the style in itself. I've always been interested in the aspect of the ninja and the, the mysteries and the stories that surround it. And it's, always, it's just always interested me ever since I was a kid. Indeed. So then why should anyone train? I think anyone should train because of, well, just because it, it also brings up a safety factor for people, especially where we live in a world where you don't know what you're going to come across or what's going to happen at any given time. Like anywhere in public, anything can happen, right? So you're better off to be prepared when that situation arises than to just be totally caught with your pants down. Indeed. What is your name? Would you like to give your name? Yeah, my name is uh, Jean-Paul Cartier. <laughs> my name is Jordan Ellis. Not related to Damien Ellis. No, not at all. <laughs> Why do you train in martial arts? I came here because I'm open to learning and I find stuff like this fun. That's pretty much my reason. I know a lot of, um, have a lot of role models who know a lot of cool stunts and stuff like this and ways to fight, so this was the best way in my city to learn how to be like them. Good answer. So why should anybody train in martial arts generally? Just generally, um, if you find it interesting, if you have a reason for it, I don't. I just like learning. So, but say you know someone who's often finds himself in trouble or yourself, you get picked on at school. Well, come here, learn stuff like this. That'll most likely stop once you throw them into the floor. Absolutely. What do you think? Same reason? He's better at words than I am. <laughs> How does one English? I don't know. Would you like to record your names? McAdam Thompson, 2018. <laughs> you are not 2018. No. You're younger than that. The year is 2018. Like Sophia Thompson, his older sister, who tries to keep him in line. And fails. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. If you guys are on Facebook, especially for martial arts, what happens or what do you think or what should you do when you come across douchebags on Facebook, especially anti-martial artists or my martial arts is better and you're a piece of... Crap. Report and block. Report and block. If I just um, ignore and move on. I was going to say, the report doesn't work. I've done it lots of times. <laughs> Facebook doesn't do anything, so just block. Neither does Twitter, FYI. Yeah. It's all yeah, automated okay. by machine. Yeah, I just... A lot of it is. Automated yeah. message back. I uh, just don't feed the fire, I guess, is the big thing, right? We didn't start the fire. Yeah, I'm sure you feel that way. Yeah. Now I gotta... Thank you for your opinion. That song. We didn't start the fire. And this wasn't me this time. It wasn't me. Yeah, don't yeah. feed the trolls. Yeah, right? Which I am a troll, so I love when people do it, but... Continue. I don't know. Do you want the next line? Yeah, I think that's about it. Like, Anything else? Block and ignore it. Yeah, I don't even bother blocking. I just ignore it. Yeah. I mean, people Some of them are just, just, If you're in certain, like, ninjutsu groups, yeah. the, well, a bad one is um, historical ninjutsu or something like that. Oh, they just debate on history. Holy crap. They're, so if, if it's not my way, it's the wrong way. I'm like, dude. Chill. And they're like scholars and stuff. Super black and white. <laughs> yeah. 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 The archery group, uh, one of the archery groups I mean, has a lot of stuff like that, too, but... Yeah. What if they try to egg you on? Say, if you don't answer me or if you block me, then you're chicken shit. Maybe outside my house, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I'll even tell you my address. I don't give a shit. No. My work address, this address right here is public. So. Yeah. No, but it's when I've even been called out by a guy in Moncton who said something, not knowing. I've never met whoever this is, and you guys haven't either. And he's like, yeah, oh, something, blah, blah, blah. It was just like two years ago. I can't even remember what he said. Something stupid, like, this sucks. And I looked up his profile, and he's like an old man with a cane. And I wrote him back and said, you're, you're free to come by any Monday, Thursday, Friday. Bring your walker. <laughs> <laughs> Never showed up. Imagine that. <laughs> Not a surprise.
All right, what if you're in a group and a moderator or an admin says you must do things our way or you have to go? Then what? Go. See you. See you later. Bye. You want to kick me out? See you later. My cats are more stressful than that. <laughs> yeah. But um, if you, you notice on our one of the forms, or the, the one that says news on the web page. So. I think it says news. There's one of the code of conduct thing mm -hmm. that I expect. No unnecessary arguing online. Once or twice you can say something. Don't sit there. And don't be one of those guys. The armchair warrior or the keyboard, keyboard, warrior. keyboard warrior or mouth jitsu. If you have a few drinks in you, you probably stay away from the internet. <laughs> Only because you couldn't type? Is that why? <laughs> no, I, just, accurately. I laugh at stuff, but that just makes me laugh. I just go on there on purpose when I'm drunk. I'm like, These people are so pissed off, it's hilarious. Oh, nice to see you again, by the way. Hey. <laughs> it's, uh, don't tell me. It's. D does it start with D? Absolutely not. No? <laughs> S. Start with an M. Uh, Mike? Nope. Mm, MacGyver. No, but closer. Ma Midorian. What? Nope. <laughs> Macintosh? No, but that's, one of, my nick that's one of my nicknames. You got the first syllable right. Ma? Mac. Matthew? Nope. No, just Mac. Mac. Mark. Mark. It's Mark. Is that it? It's like when you give up. If you say it with like an accent, are you a Mark? Does anyone know the full word of tarmac? That isn't the full it, word. That is the full word. Tarmacadam. His name's Macadam. Macadam. Hi. Macad tarmac Macadam. is the short Macadam. version. Tarmacadam. It used to be called Tarmacadam, yes. Really? So that's what I'm named after. She's Wisdom, I'm Tarmac. Hi. People walk <laughs> on me and drive on me. <laughs> I love it. And in the People hot walk, side, drive all over me. These boots are made for walking all over you. <laughs> okay, the last one. So, Ian had a phone. He dropped the phone. Ooh, cracked? No. <laughs> no. Did, he, did you crack it or just drop it? Oh, no, it cracked. Oh, he cracked it, and then he bought My a charging phone case. cord broken. It's not, dead. not the screen, though. It was the back side of it. Really? Yeah. I guess it was a glass back then? Yeah. So he bought the phone. No, he dropped the phone and then bought a phone case after. <laughs> so based yeah. on that, I had this idea. And I've had nice. a lot of people come in here to, to train hey, it looks because they were okay. robbed. Yeah, fair. Okay. Or really? someone they know was robbed. So they came in here to start learning. And then once the... The adrenaline or the, the idea of the robbery dies off, they disappear. Why should people come to martial arts? We are almost already talked about this, but why should people come to martial arts before they're robbed and not after? Because if they come before they're robbed, then they may not get robbed. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to worry about it. Duh! <laughs> And and also, it's also just preparedness to yeah. know, know what to do. Because we do scenarios here that involve, like, someone has a knife on you or yeah. someone has a gun to you or something like that, which in most robberies, I'm assuming, I don't know the stats, but I'm assuming in most robberies there's some sort of a weapon, whether it's a made-up weapon where nobody just says he has a gun in his yeah. pocket the or finger. the finger in the pocket, something stupid. I would totally be like, you got to show it first. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a 9 mil Glock? Damn, man, where'd you get that? <laughs> on your gun. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice gun. But unfortunately, there's been a few guys, I, I won't name names, but people we know that, two people actually I can think of that go to this church even, they, we've come in here and, I was robbed, my car was broken into last night, no, a trucker, I beat my horn at a trucker and he got out of his car and came over to me and was ready to knock it, for real. But then they come in, they're all serious about it and they'll stay for about a month and they're like, ah, I think I'm out of danger now. So they stop. You're, you're never really out you're of danger. Never it doesn't danger. matter how good you get at any martial art or anything. You're anything never that out can of go wrong, you'll go wrong. That's right. Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law. McAdams Law. McAdams Law. <laughs> Tar McAdams <laughs> Law. <laughs> Actually, it's funny you said that because there was a, a video I saw and it was called Ninja vs. Stoner. Okay, so this guy was in a car and he had like the bandana on and the, the tie-dye shirt. Typical hippie looking guy driving like some kind of a little hatchback. And he cut a guy off, and he was driving like an idiot on the highway. And the guy gets out of his car and says, Dude, I got kids in my car. Like, what's wrong with you? Why are you driving like that? And the guy was just laughing at him. And it was the same guy laughing at him, was filming him. And the guy went to walk away, and he, Oh, yeah, I forgot one more thing. And the window was down a crack. He went, hit the window, shattered the window, and just flipped him off and walked away. I was like, Oh, damn. 
No, it blew That's my, hard I'll have, to do. I'll have to post that on the on the page yeah. if I find it again. That's hard to do too. Yeah, he I shattered punched, one punch. Like, when I was like 20 years old, I got really pissed at someone and I hit their window three That's times and I couldn't break it. Don't watch yeah. it. <laughs> I've seen a video too of someone doing it with a hammer and they were like, boom, what the heck? In, in the, if you hit it right in the center, not hard enough, it'll, it'll it bounce bounces. off. Yeah. Take a nail punch. Yeah. The corner. The corner is the, corner even with your fist, the corner is the best place. When your car is going underwater, by the way, those handles, what people call the holy shit handles, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, those are there to get out if your car goes underwater. You grab those, kick with both feet at the corners of the window, and it'll... Hmm. And if you're going in the water, and you're going in, and your car's not filling up, roll the windows down. <laughs> Put the windows down as fast as you can, because once your car goes underwater, you can't get the windows yeah, that's down. Probably, I have heard that. The water pressure will yeah. keep your windows from going down, oh, yeah. or keep you from being able to break them. Open the door, too. Open the Definitely door or open, open the window, the something like yeah. that. Because as soon as your car is filled with water, you can open or break the windows, no problem. Because then the pressure is equalized. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But once the pressure is different, it's really hard to break your windows. Do you agree? Yeah. How come you guys are so quiet? I, I can't in martial arts just because I enjoy learning and stuff. I enjoy talking. <laughs> we Socialization. Know. So does he. We know you enjoy talking. <laughs> Socialization. Right. I was raised in St. John, and... It was definitely you were going to be robbed <laughs> once a year. Space it was going to happen. Then I moved to Elgin. Now it's not going to happen. <laughs> this is this is a clone. So these actually were... actually they stopped that after the Clone Wars. Then they, they just did. then they just kidnapped them. Well, they so stopped them after the third one. <laughs> It was it was Revenge of the Sith, they still can't and then they stopped after that. Still can't hit me. All those Vader's out. Force is <laughs> the original clone terrible. troopers. Yeah, they well, yeah, because then Execute Order sixty six. Literally changed Vader's the Earth, and they still can't hit anything. Like fair enough. It's they, the, but they were the force, though. But they weren't. They were like they forgot to equip their plot armor. I think that's what went wrong. They did. They they, they put on their basic stuff, but they forgot in the, the closet. They forgot bullets. <laughs> on the first Star Trek, <laughs> Star Wars. Skills. Which I guess would be the fourth Star Wars. Technically. Yeah. There's a scene where, when they're boarding the ship, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, all the stormtroopers come in, and there's one guy whose helmet... He hits his head? Yeah. Yes! That's great. Oh, but he, he keeps going, like no. I'm pretty sure it was an accident, but it's still fun. It was. It was an accident yeah. this part, but they kept it. There's a few of them. There's actually one where the, one of the character's boobs falls out at one point. That's the second one. Really? Yeah, Return of the Jedi, the one in Jabba the Hutt's Palace. She's, she's dancing. And she tries to pull the chain. Yeah, the twilight. And Jabba's like, oh, no, no, and hits I the button. And when she falls this. down, you see her boob totally comes out of her shirt. I was like, really? They just kept that in there? Like, that was, that was the best cut. But her boob fell out, so we're going to compensate. Like, it's, it's all <laughs> okay, right. Okay, well, I never knew that, and I'm not going to be able to unsee it. Thanks. No problem. It's, it's, it's blue. Or blue or green. Green? Green. She's I think green. it's the green one that fell. Green boob, so. Oh, really? If you're into alien stuff, then I guess that's good for you. But. Well, they really went whole ham on the body paint. Yeah, that's the thing. They didn't, they didn't pull back. That surprises right? me. They, Maybe it was planned. That's what I was wondering, too. Yeah, was and even the shirt is see-through. If, like, if you're watching it, you can actually see through it before it even happens. So there wasn't really a whole lot to the imagination by the end of it anyway. So they yeah, figured, when whatever. It was, when it was originally cached, I remember they wouldn't have been able to see it on the screen or on a television. Yeah. The resolution wasn't that high. Now it's like the 1080, yeah. the 1080i. Black and white, you can see that. Maybe. I don't know where you were. 4K. Now, yeah. 4K, I watch Star Wars in 4K, and it's horrible. Because it's so clear. That you, can see every, you can see all the, there's actually gaps in the pixels because the, the screen doesn't have enough pixels to cover Jeez. 4K. So you get all these little gaps, it's and it been looks really weird. kind of thing. Yeah, it's you've so got, bad. You've got so many dead pixels. It's like 720. That's that's Max. the best they've ever had it, and that, that's that's the best you can watch it at. Anything yeah. above that is just too much. Even 1080 is too much, I find. Jordan Ellis, no relation to Damian Ellis. That's we're just going to reiterate that. A little bit. <laughs> this was not scripted, <laughs> or was it? Anything you've heard was not and will not be scripted. The end. What's, What's my next Greg? line? What's <laughs> Uh, Look at this! This is a very powerful bomb! There are others just like it! Ready for a great fireworks show in the sky! We are the Mujahideen of the people! God has chosen us to die and you to die with us! The leader, 25-year-old Abdul Abdullah Yahya, is a notorious killer. There is nothing to fear! God awaits us all in his heavenly paradise! Outside, news spreads quickly, and reporters arrive at the scene. 
In Paris, the French Prime Minister is urgently recalled from his Christmas holiday. It's an international crisis. I spent the whole afternoon on the phone trying to find out exactly what was going on. It was pretty confused. The Algerian authorities were determined to get tough, and it was difficult to discuss the problem with them. Give me your jacket, Captain. Back in Algiers, the terrorists decide to put on the flight crew's uniforms to confuse any army snipers. Meanwhile, in the cabin, one of the terrorists is not happy with what he sees. Cover your head! Cover your head more! You too! Their Islamic customs were not being respected. Men and women sharing the same toilets, sitting next to each other. And above all, women with their heads uncovered. Unacceptable. Move towards the back. That was intolerable Hurry. for Lotfi, and it threw him Cover into a head. rage. What do you mean? <coughs> now, two hours into the hijacking, the terrorists want to talk to the Algerian military. You in the tower? We have taken control of this Air France flight. We are the armed Islamic group. Do you hear me? Do you understand? Do you hear me? What is wrong with this thing? They don't hear me. They couldn't hear you because you both talked at the same time. You have to start again. You tell them. Do it. Air France 8969. What do you want me to say? The terrorists order Captain Belem to take off for Paris. They say they're going to hold a press conference there. But the plane can't move. The passenger boarding stairs are still attached and the Algerian authorities have parked vehicles to block the runways. Air France 8969. The passenger boarding stairs are still in place. Please remove them immediately. They meet with a blank refusal. Things are starting to go wrong for the hijackers. The Algerian strategy is not to give way on a single point, but it's a dangerous policy, as they are soon to find out. We are going to block the one! We are going to block the plane and everyone is! Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Armed terrorists have hijacked an Air France jet at Algiers airport. They want to leave for Paris, but the government won't let them. It's a stalemate for the moment. I'll say it one more time. Please remove the boarding stairs so that we can leave for Paris. You think we are joking? We will show you how we are joking. We are soldiers of God. We are ready to die. We will show them. The terrorists are about to send a message to the Algerian government. During the passport check, they've identified among the passengers an officer of the Algerian police. Then two rows behind me, there was a policeman. Can you come with us, please? We need your help. He asked the policeman to follow him. It's crazy, I don't know if he knew. But he was very hesitant. He was walking, but reluctantly, because he didn't know what was going to happen to him. Open the door, please. So please take our message to the government. Few passengers are aware of the murder, nor are the pilots. If you are injured, don't quit. A lot of people quit. Why shouldn't you quit? Well, everybody gets injured at some point in their life. It's yes. You unavoidable. Never, you never know what kind of position you're going to be in if you're ever attacked. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know how to defend yourself while you're injured, you Being injured makes you more of a target. So. Well, like when we taught the blind people there at yeah. CNIB, they're victims more than most because mm. they're targeted when they see the white stick. I'm like, oh. You see that as a weakness? Yeah. yeah. Very hard to identify them. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's true, too. 
never thought of that. It's hard to, hard to be identified. Because I've known a lot of people who would get injured like a knee or a major joint injury. and like, okay, I'm out. I'm done training. That should just be more of a motivation than a, a reason to quit, right? It's either A, you've done something wrong, or B, you weren't capable enough of defending yourself at the time. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's mistakes that happen, obviously. But I totally disagree with people who quit because they were injured. Oh, I think they're going to go home. <laughs> well, see, that's different. It's, uh, uh, at the spur of the moment when you're hurt, you might need to seek medical help. Mm -hmm. But as a long-term goal, you shouldn't say that's it. I'm never doing martial arts again because I'm injured now. I got a bad knee. How that was a clue in the case I'd have to quit every job I've ever owned. had. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I broke my arm or my hand, stay actually, stay here on a Sunday at a seminar Jason was doing two years ago. Yeah. Monday, the next day, I came back to class, my hand in a cast. We had a rope strung to the basketball net out here, I climbed it. Yeah. And because too, I see that, kind of like what you were saying, is if, if you're going to go through life with a bad knee, I'm, I keep saying knee because I'm thinking of this one guy in particular who I used to train with, and he's like, oh, I hurt my knee, i got to stop training. Heavy? No, <laughs> no, this was a long time ago. Edit that. <laughs> in fact, um, I knew another guy who, when I was in high school, he was talking to me. And he's like, oh, I heard you're into martial arts and stuff, and we just kind of got talking. He's like, yeah, I used to do whatever it was, and I stopped because I hurt my knee, which seems to be a common mm -hmm. thing. But if you're suddenly injured, even if it's a permanent injury, are you now out of danger for life somehow, magically? You are. <laughs> you, you carry a little bag of uh, Lucky Charms with you. <laughs> like, like, and everybody will be like, he's magically Colost delicious, I'm going to leave him alone. Col <laughs> what do you call those bags? Colostomy, Colostomy bag. Colostomy <laughs> bag. <laughs> it's like instead of, I don't carry around pixie dust, I carry around angel dust in my wheelchair. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the thing, right? On so. a personal note, I suffer from scoliosis and arthritis in my spine, and I still train three days a week. Yeah. And uh, that, that girl, I'll, I'll just say that girl, one of the girls that comes here also has scoliosis. scoliosis. Yeah. And she still trains. That's good. And the thing is that we had one woman that came a couple times and then quit because of her scoliosis. Yeah. It, I suppose it's all in the outlook, too, how you look at things. Um, first of all, like the knee thing again. So if you did get a bad knee or you had to have some kind of artificial joint put in and now you're really bad on one side. To me, my outlook is now you just have to learn. You're learning survival skills to begin with, but now how do you learn to adapt around the injury so that you can still be effective? Or like a car accident, someone gets in a serious car accident, they have to learn to walk all over again. Or they could lay in bed all day for the rest of their life. Say, like, screw it. But they learn to walk again. They work around their injury. Or those people who have stubs <laughs> for arms. Amputated Chickens. limbs. <laughs> Chickens. This guy we work with, we call it his chicken. Yeah. But they are surprisingly adept at learning to work around it. He's an MMA fighter, only has one arm. Oh, yeah? yeah. Not, not a, he's just from Moncton. He's not like a... Pro MMA, whatever you want to call it. There, there was a guy that tried to get pro. Yeah. He went pro, and he had like one fight, and that was Dana fired him after that. He fired fire him, but let him go because of he was just getting he was going to get hurt. So they fired him for his own good. Then. Yeah. I was watching a street fight today on online. Actually, the guy, two guys outside, and one of them had half his arm missing. He, just, he was just. He'd hit him with his left and then just kind of bat him with his yeah. missing arm, <laughs> which was kind of fun. Like but. a distraction. <laughs> yeah. That's a part of the it's ninja. Old, it works with me. So when he used to drink, he'd get in the bar fights, he'd grab him with one hand and just wham him with the stump. <laughs> yeah. Stump, yeah. He, he'd get a lot of force on a short little arm. Yeah. And like Mozart was deaf, right? It was Mozart? Yeah. 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 And he created some of the best music. But that's one thing. It's like working with your injury. But the other side of it, as far as martial arts, is working around it too. So if you have a bad knee and you're at home and you're broken into in the middle of the night, 
have you learned how to defend yourself with your knee? Or have you just totally given up because you've got two bad legs? Do you train? It's like, okay, if I've broken in, this is how I'm going to have to do it, as opposed to other people. But then you can just say, forget it. And then if someone breaks in, you're screwed. That's a, a bad mentality. One of the martial arts sites on Facebook had a posting today, a video of a tournament. And Buddy had oh. just partial arms and legs. I think I saw that. He was doing like forearms? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah. And I know, personally, I know a guy in the march, in the ninjutsu, actually, who is blind, completely blind. And he's a black belt. And he's had to learn everything without the use of eyes, obviously. And another guy who's in a wheelchair, so he's never been able to learn the footwork or the proper stances just from here up. And I have no idea how he would teach that someday if he decided to, which is a whole different thing. But the fact of the matter is here's a guy that was blind and a guy that couldn't walk, and they both made it to black belt level, so they learned to adapt and work around it. So that's the lesson of the day. I've got a bad case of asshole I guess, because I'm a ginger, so... Asshole on itis? I've, yeah, I've learned to work around that in my life. <laughs> Is it true? So Fake until you make yeah. it. Oh, I can be. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I can be. But so have we. I'm gonna, but I'm oddly, <laughs> at the same time, oddly passive. In a sense that I don't like to tell people certain things because I feel like it's bringing I can bad that. news. I can but see but that. when I get mad, like, I get overly mad. There's really no happy medium with me. I'm either too passive or too aggressive, I guess, kind of yep. thing. So I have a hard time finding balance. But they say it's because you're ginger. It's possible. So if you sure. became a Jedi, you'd be in danger of becoming a Sith Lord. I'd be like Mace Windu. I'd be really close. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite there, but really close. My lightsaber would change color. I don't know. That's and then your master would say, you were to be the chosen yeah. one. <laughs> and we'd complain. <laughs> I don't want to be the chosen one. It's too much work. I don't want that. I yeah. just, I'd stand off to the side a little bit. The next one would be, and we don't have to do it today. Should we carry EDC gear, and what is it? What is EDC, not you? Does anybody know what EDC is? I say it. I'll let him. You know what it is? What does EDC stand for? It's, you'll see it a lot on line nowadays, too. Ian's corrected me many times on this. Uh, for me, it means electrical direct current. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you're talking about. <laughs> do you carry your electrical direct current on you at all times? <laughs> Well, actually, yes, I do. Is there an A? He's quite smart ass. Yeah, he does. <laughs> EAC? Is there an EAC, too? Not that I'm aware of. No, Electrical really, alternating current? No, because uh, we have chemical energy, which gets transferred into some electrical energy, and it's direct. We should start a band and call it EACEDC. <laughs> 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 anyway. Everyday carry. Everyday carry. And that will be for a future podcast. Right now, we thank you for joining us. Again, I am Sean Jason Steves, and if you wanted to get in contact, the first place you might want to look is our website at divinewarenijutsu.com.